That enjoyable music was brought to you by Stephen Logoteta and the Greater Vallejo Recreation District Band with volunteers from the Pittsburgh Community Band and Diablo Regional Concert Band. Let's give them some love, folks. We're going to start the program in about five minutes. We still have cars trying to get up here, but I don't think there's parking. Um, as long as Harold can get by, that's all we care. folks if you look behind you we have a bagpiper and he's leading Harold Bray in in a model a he will come around to the front that's Lloyd Christensen our local bagpipe player escorting Harold Bray up to the front of the stage
Harold Gray, everybody. Harold Gray. Thank you, Lloyd. Lloyd Christensen on bagpipes. Welcome, Harold. On the throne. It's pretty fitting, right? This is a great looking crowd. Thank you all for coming out. Hello and good evening. My name is David Horn and on behalf of the Benicia Community Foundation, the City of Benicia, and the Bet Veterans Memorial Hall, I would like to welcome you and thank you all for coming to honor Harold Bray and to witness the unveiling of the Harold Bray Bronze Statue. It is an honor and privilege to be here today to pay tribute to our hometown hero, Harold Bray retired Benicia police officer and the lone living survivor of the legendary USS Indianapolis CA-35, whose last mission directly contributed to the end of World War II. I would also like to extend a special welcome to the families of the USS Indianapolis the USS Indianapolis CA-35 Legacy Organization, Jane Gwynne Goodall, daughter of PV-1 rescue pilot, Lieutenant Wilbur C. Gwynn, the Navy pilot who first spotted the survivors of the USS Indianapolis and initiated their miraculous rescue at sea, and Itsuko Iida, the granddaughter of Commander Hashimoto of the submarine I-58, which sank the USS Indianapolis. Welcome. This is an amazing event. <laughs> Venetia is a city rich in history. It is said that in 1848, first word of the gold discovery found at Sutter's Mill was leaked at a Venetia tavern, thus starting the gold rush. In 1853, Venetia became the third state capital. The capitol building still stands and is now a state park and a historic landmark open for tours. As a waterfront community, Venetia was a shipbuilding center and home to thriving waterfront industries such as canneries and tanneries. Venetia is also home to the oldest cemetery in the Pacific States, the Venetia Military Cemetery. The cemetery contains 212 internments dating from 1849 to 1958. These internments include U.S. military personnel, civilians, unknowns, foreign personnel, and three military service dogs. The area that we are located right now was part of a large military arsenal which supplied weapons to U.S. troops in battles of war. Some of the notables that passed through the Benicia arsenal were Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. Today, Benicia is a thriving waterfront community known for its friendly small town charm and high quality of life. It's a great place to raise a family, rich in art, music, and culture with wonderful shops and restaurants. It's no wonder that Harold decided to settle here. I know he liked the weather though too. This beautiful building behind me was the Benicia Arsenal Commanding Officers Quarters, which was built in 1860. It was restored in 2009 and now houses Arts Benicia, a nonprofit art center supporting the visual arts in our community. Across the way, and you're gonna to have to take my word for it because the trees have grown there, is the clock tower built in 1859 as a three-story stone fort. 
This is not the original design because unfortunately it was gutted by an explosion and fire in 1912. It was restored as a two-story building that stands today. It is now used for trade shows, art shows, community events, and conventions. Tomorrow, the 78th annual USS Indianapolis Reunion Dinner and Dance will be held there. As you can tell, you probably can tell I love living in Venetia. Venetia is a place where you want to live, not a place where you have to live. But, and I could go on about Venetia all night, but enough about Venetia. Let's get back to why we are really here today, to honor this great man, Harold Bray. <laughs> Harold Bray's story is about service, dedication, honor, camaraderie, resilience, and perseverance. It is about a life of service that started at an early age in the ROTC, then the United States Navy, where he was awarded a Purple Heart and a World War II Victory Medal for his service on the Indy, and finally our wonderful community of Benicia, where Mr. Bray would settle, raise a family, and become a beloved member of the Benicia Police Department and community. We have a great program today, but before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of the people and organizations that contributed to this day to honor Mr. Harold Bray. Of course, I'd like to start with the Bray family, the families of USS Indianapolis CA-35, the USS CA-35 Legacy Organization, the Director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, Samuel J. Cox, Rear Admiral, United States Navy, retired the former CEO of the Spartan Corporation, Captain William Toady, United States Navy, retired. The Regent of the Chief Solano Chapter, National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, Don Witherspoon. The United States Coast Guard Air Station, San Francisco. The USS San Francisco CA-38 Memorial Foundation. James York of the California State Guard Military, Museum Command Unit 1. Jane Gwynne Goodall, daughter of PB-1 rescue pilot L Lieutenant Wilbur C. Gwynne. Atsuko Iida, granddaughter of Commander Hishimoto. Venetian Mayor Steve Young, the Mare Island officials. Our wonderful band with conductor Stephen Logateta and the Greater Vallejo Recreation District Band with volunteers from the Pittsburgh Community Band and Diablo Regional Concert Band. Bagpiper Lloyd Christensen, Pastor of Care Megan Friedman of Northgate Church, the Benicia Veterans Memorial Hall Rifle Team, Don Golden, Bugler, American Legion Post One, Phil Green, Pastor, Lighthouse Covenant Fellowship, and last but not least, the Benicia Community Foundation. Let's please put your hands together for those people. I would now like to welcome up Pastor of Care, Megan Freedom from Northgate Church for the invocation. Thank you, David. Hello, my people. You look wonderful. Thank you for the privilege of getting to be invited to be part of this tremendous evening. Will you pray with me? Almighty, everlasting God, Thank you for the gifted hands that created this work of art in the likeness of your servant, Harold Bray. I pray that whenever we look at this with our bodily eyes, we may call to mind his life of service and the lives of those that perished in the hours and days after the USS Indianapolis fell victim to attack. We know that your love and sacrifice extends to them and to us. Oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed son to preach peace to those who are far off and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Your kingdom where your will is done. Give us the desire and the strength to love you and to love our neighbor. In the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, Megan. That was beautiful. I would now like to bring up David Batchelor, chair of the Benicia Community Foundation, to lead us all in the Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to ask you to please rise and stay standing afterwards for the national anthem. David Batchelor. Good evening. Here's the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic. Please stand for the national anthem. Thank you very much. I would now like to welcome Benicia Mayor Steve Young for the proclamation. Thank you, David. This is a proclamation that was given to the Bray family a couple weeks ago at the city council meeting. And it's in recognition of Harold Bray, Benicia's hometown hero and veteran. Whereas Harold Bray was born in Ramsey, Michigan in 1927, joined the Navy when he was 17, was sent to Mare Island for service after boot camp, and honorably served in the Navy from January 26, 1945 to August 3, 1946. And whereas during his service, Harold Bray demonstrated unparalleled courage, resilience, and sacrifice while defending our cherished freedoms and protecting our way of life. And whereas Harold Bray made the history books when he was assigned to the USS Indianapolis and subsequently survived one of the most dramatic maritime tragedies in US history. And whereas Harold, whereas the ship's sinking after undergoing attack led to the greatest single loss of life at sea in the history of the US Navy, of the 1,195 sailors and marines on board, only 316 survived. Harold Bray is the last remaining survivor of the USS Indianapolis crew. And whereas Harold Bray helped to protect Benicia's residents and preserve the city's way of life by serving with the Benicia's police reserves from 1959 to, six, to 1963 and the Benicia Police Department from 1963 until his retirement in 1982, and was also instrumental in setting up the Police Athletic League sports program for the youth of Benicia. And whereas Harold Bray has displayed remarkable selflessness and compassion beyond his military service, continuously dedicating his time and efforts to support and uplift fellow veterans, as well as actively engaging in volunteer work, community service initiatives and mentorship positively impacting the lives of countless individuals in Benicia and beyond. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Steve Young, Mayor of the City of Benicia, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Benicia, extend our deepest gratitude and profound respect to Harold Bray, a true hometown hero and veteran, and hereby proclaim July 7th, 2023, as Harold Bray Day, and encourage Benicia residents to attend the statue unveiling happening right now.
Thank you, Mayor Young. I'd now like to bring up a speaker. She's the regent of the Chief Solano Chapter, National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution. Please welcome Dawn Witherspoon. Good evening, Benicia Community Foundation, distinguished guests and friends. On behalf of the National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, I'm so pleased to join you today in celebrating a true hometown hero, Mr. Harold Bray. The DAR is a non-political, non-profit women's service organization that was founded in 1890. Our three pillars of service include promoting patriotism, preserving American history, and education. When we learned of the project to build the seven foot bronze statue of Mr. Bray, we enthusiastically volunteered to sponsor this historic project that this undertaking reflects our values. The statue will endure far into the future and tell some of the history of a true patriot and the war he served. Mr. Bray, on behalf of a grateful nation, I'm honored to present you with a certificate of appreciation and a DAR challenge coin as a small token of our appreciation for your continued service to our country. The certificate reads, in appreciation of a lifetime of service to country and community. Thank you, Don Witherspoon. We now have our keynote speaker. He's the director of Naval History and Heritage Command, Sam J. Cox, Rear Admiral, United States Navy, retired. Samuel Cox. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Harold. Mayor Young, uh, all previous greetings and salutations remain in effect. Uh, however, I do want to give a shout out to the band for that incredible, uh, inspirational <laughs> medley of the TV show from the 1950s, Victory at Sea. Uh, when I was a very young kid in Indianapolis, my punishment for being bad was to be not allowed to watch reruns of Victory at Sea. So I come by this naturally. Uh, I can't tell you how much of, a, of an honor it is for me to be here today. Uh, whenever the Navy, or whenever there's a memorial service uh, for sailors who are lost in battle or lost at sea, the Navy makes a promise to their families that we will not forget them. Uh, and that's fundamentally my mission uh, as the director of the Naval History and Heritage Command. So I deeply appreciate everyone who came out here today uh, to help me with that mission. And whether you realize it or not, you are still contributing to the defense of the United States of America. Our nation has gone through periods where our Navy went into decline and it was not because the Navy couldn't afford a strong Navy, it was because the nation chose not to afford a strong Navy. So if we don't have the support of the American people, then we will not have the strong Navy that we need, and we may very well find ourselves in a future conflict with the same disadvantage as we started World War II. Uh, so again, everything that you do uh, to help support the United States Navy and the defense of our country uh, matters. Uh, today, we are here in particular to uh, uh, honor a representative of a generation, uh, you know, Harold Bray, uh, who fought and finished the most costly and bloodiest war in the history of mankind. Uh, over 60 million people uh, died across the world you know, during that war. Uh, and today we have the opportunity to thank uh, one member. When I first spoke, the first time I spoke to the Indianapolis reunion group was in 2016. 
Uh, and I believe there are about 19 survivors of Indianapolis uh, still alive at that time. Uh, and I noted that uh, we have an increasingly rare opportunity to personally thank uh, those who won that war uh, and express our gratitude in person for every one of us having the freedom that so many take for granted today because of their sacrifice. Uh, we, yeah, I just lost my train of thought here. The, uh, it's worth, Harold Bray, you know, not only served his country uh, during that war, he also came back to this town, this city, uh, and chose to serve and protect the citizens of, of this city uh, in a potentially equally dangerous uh, occupation, uh, for which I think we all are gratitude to have great gratitude for that uh, as well. Uh, Harold took part uh, in, and I'm, as a director of Naval History, I get to make statements like this. Uh, the mission of the Indianapolis uh, was the most important conducted by any single ship uh, in World War II, uh, and a case could be made in the entire history of the United States Navy. Uh, because it delivered key components of the first atomic bomb uh, that was used on Hiroshima uh, and brought the end of that war. The, uh, we can, armchair, you know, generals will, you know, discuss uh, whether we should have used the bomb, you know, or not. Uh, I would submit that uh, the leadership at the time was faced with every option was incredibly bad. Uh, every option resulted in enormous loss of life. Uh, none of the alternatives would have resulted in less loss of life. Uh, and so President Truman and the leaders of this country made a very difficult choice uh, that ended that war, that terrible war, as quickly as possible. And there are probably millions of descendants of both Americans and Japanese who are alive today uh, because we chose the quick end of the war rather than a long and even more costly uh, end to the war. Uh, I would note that by the time the Enola Gay uh, took off uh, from Tinian, uh, those on that island, you know, understood that the Indianapolis had been lost with heavy loss of life, uh, and inscribed on that first bomb was from the boys of Indianapolis to the Emperor of Japan. Uh, the good thing now is that, you know, Japan is one of our best allies and friends, uh, which is kind of a, a near miracle based on how vicious that war was and how quickly it turned around to, to be, you know, completely different. And I would argue it was because we are magnanimous in victory and not vindictive uh, in victory. Uh, but that's all kind of not the point for the crew of the Indianapolis because none of them had a choice uh, in the matter. Uh, on the 12th of July, uh, 1945, Captain McVeigh, the skipper, was given orders to prepare his ship uh, to get underway for a special mission. Uh, and on the 15th of July, he over at Bear Island, where this Indianapolis was finishing up uh, repairs from being hit by a kamikaze off of Okinawa, uh, he met uh, with Rear Admiral Purnell uh, and Captain Parsons, who were key members of the Manhattan Project, in particular Project Alberta, which was actually the weaponization uh, of the you know, creation of the bomb. He was not told what his cargo was. He was just told that every day he saved on the transit would shorten the war by that amount. Uh, he was told not to share the horizon with any other ship, i.e. keep this whole thing a secret, don't be seen. Uh, except for a quick in and out fuel stop at, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and he was also told that no matter what happens to the ship or anyone, save the cargo. Uh, and the cargo was part, the uranium part of the bomb that was the actual that part that would be fired into the other part of the uranium in order to create uh, a chain reaction and an explosion. Uh, the other half of the uranium was flown to Tinian, but uh, Indianapolis had that piece of it, which was half of the uranium that existed, uh, uranium-235 that existed in the world at the time. That's how critical it was. Uh, and the other cargo was the actual the assemblies for the bombs, 
um, that were, you know, had no nuclear material, but were just the, the actual bomb that, that the nukes would be put in. And in the, in, then in the course of the, the transit, uh, Indianapolis set the speed record, which still stands today, from Farallon Islands to uh, Pearl Harbor and then on to Tinian. Uh, so the Indianapolis did their mission uh, to perfection. Uh, they did their duty exactly what the country expected of them to do uh, and then went on to to get back into the war and and suffer uh, the fate of, uh, of what happened in, in meeting with the japanese submarine in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night uh, most people when you talk to veterans of, of world war ii uh, they will say that they're not a hero uh, that the real heroes were the ones who not who didn't come home uh, I would say that those are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they're all heroes, uh, and particularly on board a ship. Because whether one lives or dies on board a ship in battle is actually about a random event, as, as you can imagine. Uh, bombs from above, torpedoes, mines from below, shells from the side. Uh, there is no safe place on a ship. There's no rear area. There's no place to hide. Uh, everyone from the captain on down shares the same danger, and whether they live through it or whether they don't live through it uh, is whether that shell or bomb or torpedo has your name on it or not. Uh, and in fact, if Harold had not, if Harold had been sleeping where he normally slept. Uh, none of us would be here today talking about this because he would not have survived the torpedo hit. So, you know, that's 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 combat at sea. Uh, it's a little different uh, when you wind up in the water afterwards. There's still a fair amount of randomness and chance uh, involved. Those who were severely wounded weren't going to last very long. Uh, the sharks did have a choice. Uh, the people in the water, you know, didn't. Uh, the choice that the folks in the water had is whether they had the indomitable will to survive uh, or not. Uh, and Harold Bray was one who had that will uh, and endured uh, beyond what any of us here uh, can possibly imagine. Uh, and of those who didn't make it off the ship, um, the, the suffering that they endured before they passed is, is just something behind, beyond you know, any of our comprehension. Uh, so I would still argue that you know, everyone, hero. Uh, and in the course of the, the, the survival you know, of the men on the Indianapolis, you know, continues to serve as an inspiration to the US Navy today. Uh, and their motto, uh, which is you know, never quit, uh, is exactly in line with what the Navy is imbued with. And in my tie, you know, says, don't give up the ship. Uh, at the Naval Academy, there's a banner that dates back to the War of 1812, don't give up the ship. Uh, and with that banner is all the names of those Naval Academy graduates who were killed in action, you know, over the last, you know, 200 uh, plus years. And anytime you start feeling sorry for yourself for having a bad day, you go down there and look at that banner, look at that don't give up the ship, but don't quit. It, it's, the, it's the very same idea. So although we celebrate uh, the survival of 360 men from that ship, uh, it's also equally important that we never forget the 880 uh, who didn't make it back. Um, about 300 of them went down with the ship uh, that was probably more merciful than those who endured the, the unspeakable, uh, you know, before they passed in the water. Uh, the whole thing was not the Navy's finest hour. There was considerable confusion. Uh, Navy did not know that the Indianapolis had gone down for several days. Uh, once we did know, the rescue effort happened very quickly, uh, but many men perished uh, who otherwise should have survived. Uh, because of the delay uh, in that. And for that, the, the Navy learned many lessons uh, that we still keep in mind today. Uh, and so that the sacrifice of those 880 uh, was not in vain. Uh, I think uh, one thing, you know, to kind of get close to the end here is, uh, you know, to kind of sum it up. 
those who are familiar with the Indianapolis story will, will have heard about the destroyer escort, you know, Underhill, which actually really didn't have anything to do with it, but it's part of the, the whole, you know, equation. Uh, but several days before the Indianapolis was lost, uh, there was a convoy traveling, U.S. convoy traveling from Okinawa to Luzon. And it was carrying several thousand U.S. Army soldiers who had survived three months of the most horrific ground combat of probably the entire war. Uh, and we're going to Luzon for rest and recuperation in preparation for the invasion of Japan. Uh, that convoy was attacked by a submarine, uh, and the underhill uh, interposed itself between the submarine and a manned suicide torpedo and saved the convoy by ramming that torpedo, but the torpedo blew up, uh, and the underhill was sunk and lost with, along with 316 of her, her crew, I'm sorry, 113 of her crew uh, during that. But the commanding officer of one of the ships that was saved uh, by the Underhill's action, you know, wrote the following, which is directed at, you know, veterans, but I think there's something in here for everybody. And it's, quote, peace-loving people throughout the world today are grateful to those who have given their lives to further the cause of freedom and democracy. But to the men whose very lives have been saved by the heroic deeds of their fighting comrades, this gratitude assumes the strength of an unpayable personal debt. Everlasting are the vivid memories of thousands of us who have seen our comrades sacrifice their lives so that we may live. If only the entire world could feel the same personal indebtedness toward these heroes, it would be a great impetus toward attaining the free and peaceful world for which these men were fighting. The attainment of this goal can be our only reasonable tribute. In addition to the 880 men who were lost on the Indianapolis, uh, just under 36,000 other Navy personnel were lost uh, during the war, mostly in the Pacific, but some in the Atlantic Mediterranean uh, as well. And almost that many were lost in uh, operational accidents, if you will. Uh, almost all of those who were killed in action and many of those who died in, in uh, accidents uh, are still at sea somewhere. There's, there's no headstone, no tombstone, no statue. Uh, and so I think this statue, besides honoring Harold Bray, uh, can also serve as a reminder to all those who sacrificed, who made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we hold dear today. So I'll just close with a quote. It's actually uh, from a British source. Uh, it's an inscription on a monument that's in the godforsaken jungle on the border between uh, India and Burma, uh, and it's in honor of British soldiers uh, who gave their lives fighting the Japanese there. Uh, and the inscription on the monument says, when you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. And I think all of us uh, should remember that, uh, remember those who were lost. Uh, and remember the motto of the crew of the USS Indianapolis, never quit. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Cox. Now I'd like to welcome back Megan Friedman to sing God Bless America. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam god bless america my home sweet home
Such a beautiful voice. Thank you, Megan. Oh, I guess I shouldn't raise it too much because our next speaker, <laughs> sorry, Debbie, <laughs> is, is Harold's daughter-in-law, Debbie Bray. Please welcome Debbie. Can you guys in the back here, okay? Debbie Bray. I am Harold Bray's daughter-in-law. Sincerely, on behalf of Harold and the whole family, we would really like to thank everybody for this honor that celebrates Harold. And everything, you know, celebrating him for his commitment to community and country. He's very humble and he's always amazed if anything like this ever happens. He will laugh and he would say, he said, why would anybody want to do this? And he said, I don't know. And he just shakes his head. So a little bit about Harold. He grew up in Michigan and he joined the Navy at 17. He talked his dad into signing for him. He went off to basic training. He ended up in Vallejo, California. He loved California weather. He would always say Michigan has seven months of freezing winter and five months of bad weather. <laughs> so he loved California. So in July, the sailors got an urgent message to return to the ship USS Indianapolis. It would be his first ship. They left Mare Island for Hawaii where a large box was brought on board and it was constantly guarded by Marines. They had no idea what it was. He said they would bet each other about what was in there. They, some thought it was probably a case of whiskey for MacArthur. <laughs> they delivered this secret box in the island of Kinian on July 26th and headed home. They had no idea that they had just delivered the components for little boy, the bomb that would end the war. Dad said it was so warm that the captain had given them permission to sleep on board if they wanted to. And he never did until the night of July 29th. He said, for some reason, he thought, I'm going to sleep out there tonight. He was asleep under a gun turret and at 1215, July 30th, the Japanese, Japanese torpedoes struck the Indy. They say she sank in under 15 minutes, 1,197 men were on board. They think maybe 900 made it into the water. I know you all know the story. They spent five days in shark infested waters waiting and waiting and waiting because surely the Navy was on their way to rescue them. Sadly, the Navy didn't even know they were missing. One day, an American pilot searching for submarines saw something in the water. He was convinced that they were Americans. <clears throat> he finally convinced his superiors who said, no, nobody's missing. When he finally convinced them, the rescues began. By the time ships re reached them, after five days, only 316 were left. The groups were spread out. Dad always said the scariest time was when the USS Bassett finally arrived to pick up sailors. It took time to rescue these men. They were all so weak for days being in the water with no food and no water to drink. And they would, it took a while to try to get them on the ships and the sharks were still always around. He said he remembers when they got to him and they asked him if he could make it up to Jacob's Ladder. He remembers saying, hell yeah. And then he realized he couldn't even lift his arms up. They said, don't worry, sailor, we got you. And these men probably would not have survived another day. So he spent time recovering. And when he left the Navy, he came back to Vallejo. Love this weather. He worked as a painter in Benicia Industrial Park. He got married and started a family. Debbie, then Patty, then Harold III. Most of the family called him partner. They moved to Benicia and after a few years, he joined the Benicia Police Department. He is badge number one. Harold, not because of his age, he always said they just happened to give him that. <laughs> Harold Sr. always loved kids and as a police officer, he made an impression on many of them. Here we are 40 years after he retired 
and we still hear stories about he, how he impacted their lives. It's hard to even imagine. I mean, after 40 years, most people wouldn't even remember you, let alone remember details about your life and what you meant to them. He always looked pretty mean. <laughs> Friends would laugh because everybody was scared to death of him because he'd drive around, have that grimace on. He had those aviator sunglasses, those signature sunglasses where everybody was like, I don't know what to think about him. Then they'd meet him and they'd realize how friendly he really was. Some of partner's friends still have stories about how they'd get into small trouble, small trouble, but Earl would chew them out, scare them, and let them go. For a long time, if kids got into trouble, he'd make them come to the police department at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning to wash the police cars for punishment. He said, these kids didn't do things to go to jail. They're just young and dumb. They just need a little scare. He was instrumental in starting the PAL in Benicia, the Fleet Athletic Leagues for Kids, the sports for kids. So he always was making sure that these kids could play, even if they couldn't afford shoes or, un shoes or uniforms but somehow they always got them. And recently somebody shared a story with us and I love this, but it was many of us around town remember when city council chambers was the courthouse with Judge Swan. And this gentleman said he went to court for something and there was a couple teenagers in there. One was standing before Judge Swan and he said, the judge said, so you got a ticket? He said, yes, I got a ticket that I want to contest. He said, okay, bring it up here. So he's reading it, and he looked at him, and he said, Harold Bray gave you a ticket? He said, yes, sir. He said, Harold Bray gave you a ticket, whatever it was, you deserve it. Denied. Get out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> the guy said he still remembers that. So in 1981, he remarried to a wonderful woman named Stephanie. They're so much fun. They both have the best sense of humor, and it's... It's just, I mean, they're just perfect for each other. And Hurl had become known around town as Big Daddy. I'm not really sure how that ever came to be or whatever, but in the 50 years I've known him, he's always been Big Daddy. His daughter, Patty, passed away in 2001 after a long fight with cancer, and he was in his early 70s. He was heartbroken when she passed, like we all were. We literally, so he and partner had a special bond and they were best friends, they were. We literally lived less than a block from each other. Partner was a building contractor and in the 80s when dad retired, he went to work with him. I don't know how much work got done. But sometimes he would paint, sometimes he'd do a little carpentry. Most of the time they were laughing on these job sites. And sadly, my husband died last year in an accident and it's been devastating to everybody. So we were married 46 years and this blind side was something none of us imagined. And then there were only two survivors left on the Indianapolis. And last year, Thetis LeBeau passed, leaving Harold as the last, last sailor standing watch. So this has been a really hard year with losses. But when he found out about the statue, he just laughed. And I was showing him these pictures that they wanted me to show him. And he said, why would anybody want to do this? I said, I don't know, apparently some people like you. <laughs> so we laughed about it and he just couldn't get over it. And he's just very humble. And he says he just can't imagine why people would want to do this. He isn't anything special. But if you know him, you know he's very special. So. <laughs> We are very lucky to have him in our lives, and he is a hometown hero, and there's not many of those left. But again, we just want to thank you guys for honoring him, and a special thanks to the Benicia Community Foundation, this amazing amount of time and work that they have done is incredible. We know how special he is, and hopefully you have an understanding of how wonderful he is. Thank you. I want to keep you up here for a minute, Debbie. And Stephanie, if you could also come up here, please. We have a special presentation for you. On behalf of Ganesha Community Foundation, we'd like to present the Bray family with the first unveiling of 
with their statue. Put your hands together for Debbie Bray. That was an excellent story. So it's so nice to learn about. You know, the more I learn about Harold, the just the more it just touches my heart. Really, I mean, when they asked me to do this, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, and I started studying and watching Harold speak and looking at. I watched Jaws. I watched the documentary. I, I did everything because. I really, I knew the story, but I really didn't know it well enough. Unbelievable. Harold, thank you so much. All right, so it's time for our 21-gun salute. So please stand for the rifle team from the Benicia Veterans Memorial Hall. They're right over here, and we're going to do a 21-gun salute. Thank you, Benicia Veterans Memorial Hall Rifle Team and Don Golden, Bugler, American Legion Post 101, and also a member of the band tonight. I always thought the 21 gun salute was 21 guns, but it can be three guns, it can be seven guns, it can be any, and it can be 21 guns. That was really cool. First one I've seen. I'd now like to invite up Phil Green, the pastor of Lighthouse Covenant Fellowship, for the closing prayer. Thank you. Uh, bow your heads with me, please. Father, we thank you for this moment in time you've given to us today. Uh, your word says for us to give honor to honor its due. And so we give this man great honor today. Uh, we thank you for his heart to be a servant, in fact, Lord, you said you didn't come to be served, but to be a servant for all. And so that same mindset you deposited in this man to be a servant. Father, we thank you for your word that says a good man gives inheritance to its children's children. And so we thank you for the inheritance, the legacy that this man has left the Bray family to serve, to serve, and to serve. And so we give you glory and honor, continue to preserve this man and his family and his legacy. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Phil. Wow. This is a day I'm never going to forget, really. All you folks showing up, Harold here all these wonderful people speaking. Thank you all so much for coming. I feel so fortunate to have been able to share it with all of you, especially you, Mr. Bray. I love that we are here just three days after Independence Day, the United States of America's 247th birthday. May we never forget that freedom isn't free. May we always remember the bravery, the sacrifice, and the service of those like Harold Bray that kept 
and to con continue to keep our country safe. And we must never forget the United States of America is the land of the free because of the brave. We wouldn't be here celebrating without the vision, hard work, and leadership of the Benicia Community Foundation. So it is with great respect and admiration that I welcome my friend and the chair of the Benicia Community Foundation Board of Directors. Please put your hands together for David Batchelor. Well, I agree with Dave, our MC. Wow. What a blessing it is today. I stand here before you representing me, so many talented people, organizations, businesses, and Benicia, to let you know the creation and installation of the Harold Bray statue in Benicia is a testament to the remarkable community, camaraderie, and the unwavering spirit of this town. It is through the collective efforts of dedicated individuals, businesses, and organizations that we are here today witnessing, witnessing this significant milestone. Countless hours of hard work, unwavering support, and generous contributions have, have united us in this shared endeavor. The statue serves not only as a symbol of Harold Bray's inspirational survival, but also a reminder of the power of our community spirit. Together we have demonstrated that when a community comes together with a common purpose, there is no limit to what cannot be achieved. Let us take pride in our shared accomplishments and continue fostering the spirit of togetherness for the betterment of Benicia and our residents. I'd have to say God bless Benicia, God bless our country, and God bless all of you for being here today to pay tribute to the legacy of the USS Indianapolis CA-35, our veterans, and to those local hero, our local hero, Harold Bray, Thank you, Mr. Bray. At this time, I'd like to also thank you to, uh, to also thank you to, uh, to those that have made this possible. The Bray family, David Horn, our master of ceremonies, the families of the USS Indianapolis CA-35, Rear Admiral Samuel Cox, the United States Navy retired, Director of U.S. Navy History and Heritage Command. Venetia Mayor, Steve Young, Vice Mayor, Terry Scott, Council Members, Terry Birdseye, Tom Campbell, and Trevor Mazinski. Interim City Manager, Mario Giuliani. Venetia Police Department, Venetia Fire Department, Arts Venetia, Pedrati Ace Hardware. The Lions Club, Luke's, Luke George Photography. The Pastime Grudge, Venetia Plumbing, BPX Printing, Laverty Construction, John Laverty. Diablo A's Model A Ford Club of America, John B Bailey. Balloon Works, our conductor, the Great Vallejo, the Greater Vallejo Recreation District Band and volunteers from the Pittsburgh Community Band and Vallejo Regional Band. Play it Interactive would put all this, this turf down. The Venetia Scouts, John Garvey, author, Chief Warrant Officer, two, historian, California State Guard, Military Museum, Commander. Pastor Megan Friedman, Bagpiper Lloyd Christensen. Valero Refinery, a major contributor to all of Venetia. And last but not least, our Venetia Community Foundation for their ongoing dedication and support to the, to the, resi to the residents of Venetia. And to the Harold Bray Project Committee that worked limitless hours, planning, organizing, and working to make this day possible. Please join me in giving them all a big hand. Thank you. I love this town. We love you too. Yes, we do. Gotta love that guy. He's got nothing but love in his heart. He loves Benicia. He wants to bring Benicia together. He wants to foster uh, relationships with youth, organizations, businesses, and all people, all residents of Benicia. David Batchelor is a great guy, and the Benicia Community Foundation is a great foundation. In 2020, ahead of the 75th anniversary of the July 30th, 1945 tragedy, the crew of the USS Indianapolis were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in recognition of their perseverance, bravery, and service to the United States. 
Mr. Bray, we all want to thank you so much for your service to our country and community. We have so much gratitude for you and the rest of the USS Indianapolis crew. After the presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Mike Gilday asked sailors to remember the Indy crew in a period of reflection. He said, remember their courage and devotion to each other in the face of the most severe adversity. Remember their valor in combat and the role they played in ending the most devastating war in history. Honor their memory and draw strength from their legacy. Those brave sailors and Marines endured impossible hardships by banding together, and we must all do the same today. Lieutenant Wilbur C. Gwynn, pilot of the PV-1 Venture Bomber, will always be known to the USS Indy survivors, friends, and families as their angel. It is so wonderful that despite the adversity the Indy family and Commander Hashimoto endured, they united, became one, and found forgiveness in each other's heart. This can be a valuable lesson for all of us. I just uh, heard a story that um, Harold recently reached out to the last survivor of I-58, the submarine, um, to make a connection and to say, you know, to let them know that there was no hard feelings, and um, the the person got back to them. And I think I think that just continues on today. Um, that's really wonderful. Thank you. This beautiful statue that we're about to unveil is looking to be placed downtown on First Street for all to see. I can't wait to see its final location. In closing, I want to thank you all for coming this evening to witness the unveiling of the Harold Bray bronze statue and to honor Mr. Harold Bray, one of America's heroes. God bless you all and God bless America. Never forget. Woo! Yes, um, David Batchelor has another presentation for Harold. Actually, is Terry Scott out here? Terry, you here? You want to come on up? Vice Mayor Terry Scott. Thank you. Uh, I was handed this a few hours ago. It's from the state of California Senate, a certificate of recognition from Senator Bill Dodd, and it reads, Harold Bray, in special recognition of your exceptional and honorable service aboard the legendary USS Indianapolis, your bravery, endurance, and perseverance mark a monumental moment in history as you and 1,194 other sailors were assigned a vital mission that would assist in ending World War II. As a lone survivor, may your contributions be remembered by future generations. Your heroism has earned you this recognition because of your commitment and determination. You are deserving of this highest recommendation and commendation from the people of the state of California. Congratulations and best wishes from the state of California. Presented Friday, July 7, 2023, Benicia, California. Bill Dodd, Bill Dodd, Senator, District 3. Wow, you seem like a, people like you. <laughs> Go figure, right? Big Daddy. Scary guy. Doesn't look too scary to me. Looks like a great guy. That's right. So, it pretty much concludes our program. We're now going to have Mr. Bray and all of our speakers and dignitaries join us on the lawn for the unveiling while the band entertains us with some music. Again, thank you all for coming. After um, we do the unveiling, there will be time for pictures and all sorts of fun stuff. So, everybody stick around and enjoy this 
beautiful evening. Now, they said it was going to be super windy in Benicia, and, and Harold asked them if they would just turn the fan down a little bit, and I think they did. So it's got a lot more power than you think, folks. Anyway, you've been a great audience. Thank you, all the people that came from so far. I met some people from Minnesota. I've met people from Washington and all over the United States that have come for this. So thank you all. Thank you, Benicia residents, for coming out. From everybody else, uh, on behalf of Benicia Community Foundation, thank you. Have a great night. Could I have the police officers come up to help Harold down the steps, please? Benicia Police, thank you so much for your service also. Benicia Fire. All of these guys are true American heroes, and they all like to serve the citizens, the communities of the United States. do the unveiling. You saw the miniature one. The big one is, I'll tell you, when we first got it, we unscrewed the front of it, we opened it, and a couple people had tears in their eyes. It was, it was unbelievable. It's such a beautiful statue. Take note of the watch on the statue. The watch is Harold's watch exactly, and it stopped exactly at the time he hit the water. His dog tags are identical to the dog tags he wore, and the likeness is incredible. Let's give Harold a round of applause, folks. was his watch and it has the time that he went into the water That's right. when you come up you'll know also notice the detailing on the the bottom part the sharks the pv1 plane and the other plane that came and uh, landed in the water even though they told him they should to get those guys out of the water as quick as they could What do you think? You guys want to make some noise? You like this statue? Thank you once again, Harold. Venetia loves you, buddy. We love you, Harold. That's right. America loves you.
So we ended our program a little early, just because I, I guess I talked too quick or something. But um, there is supposed to be a flyover by the United States Coast Guard Air Station One out of San Francisco, and they should be flying over uh, shortly. Another way to honor Mr. Harold Gray. Okay, it's a bad house out here. <laughs> yes. Um, Perhaps they work for the Navy, and they were late uh, to, re to rescue them. They were late to fry over, just like the Navy was late to rescue these guys. Yeah, hopefully the Coast Guard will get here quicker than four and a half days. You guys have been great audience. Thank you to our sound guy. Thank you to the band. Thank you to everybody who contributed. Unfortunately, um, take your time leaving. I mean, to, you know, the statue is going to be boxed up and put away again until it finds its home down, um, hopefully down on First Street in Venetia for all to enjoy. So, rotate through here so everybody can get a chance to get a picture with it.
If anybody would like to buy a challenge coin, they're really cool. They are for sale at the Venetian Community Foundation's booth. Go check them out. They're beautiful. It's a challenge coin. Yeah. 